Well, we're in a series on, in the book of, of Hebrews. We've been in it for six months approximately. Uh, it feels, feels like it though, doesn't it? So our pastor, Andy, um, is on sabbatical. He actually returns tomorrow and we've survived. We made it. We made it. Yes. And so we, we hope he returns, we, he returns very rested and energized and ready to lead us well. So we've been in a series called Greater. Uh, on the book of Hebrews. And so just to give us a lay of the land, especially if this is your first time here, just kind of where we are in the book of Hebrews, we're almost at the finish line. And so the book of Hebrews is written to a group of Hebrews, Jews, who've now become Christians. And they live in Italy and they're beginning to suffer for their faith. Both the Romans and the Jews are beginning to persecute them for following Jesus. And so they're tempted to maybe assimilate a bit more and to compromise a little bit so that they won't suffer for their faith. And so this letter is a big encouragement to them to remain faithful to Jesus. So it's all about how Jesus is greater. He's greater. He, the, the faith you have in Jesus is better than the Jewish faith, he tells them, because while in the Jewish faith, the messenger were angels, God himself is now bringing you a message, and it's a message of good news, not just for the Jews, but for all people. And Jesus is a better deliverer than the Jews deliverer, Moses, because Jesus delivers us not out of Egypt into a promised land, but out of sin and shame and separation into being a new creation. And God and Jesus is a better priest than the priest of the Jewish faith because Jesus is a flawless and forever priest. And he is greater than the sacrifice of the Jews because they had to offer sacrifices over and over again. But Jesus is a flawless sacrifice offered once and for all. It's done. Now, after each one of these sections, when he shows how Jesus is greater than their Jewish faith, he then gives them a stern warning, remain faithful to Jesus, because what you have in Jesus is greater than what you left behind in Judaism. So cling to Jesus, remain faithful. Now, what does it look like to remain faithful to God, even when it's hard? He gives us chapters 11 through 13, which is a hall of faith, these role models. This is what it looks like to remain faithful to God, even when you're suffering. And the greatest example of that, he says, is Jesus, which is where we pick up today in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we are in the big picture of the book. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's okay. We have them on the seats around you. Grab one of these. Take it with you if you don't have a Bible. Um, be, feel free to mark in this Bible as well. Take it with you and read it every day. I'm going to read the entire section, Romans 12, verses 1 through 13. Let's look at this together. And then we'll go back to the beginning and look at it verse by verse. So let's read the whole thing together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these witnesses are all those followers of God there in Hebrews 11, witnesses, not meaning they watch us, but meaning they testify to us that this is what it looks like to follow God faithfully. They're witnessing to us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his sons? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. So how much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? Verse 10, they, our human fathers, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Verse 12, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may, be may not be disabled, 
but rather be healed. So let's go back to the beginning and let's look at this. And the first, the first uh, truth that we want to take away from this passage is that there is a cost of discipleship. There is a cost of discipleship. Look with me there. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The fact that he says this race requires perseverance means that there's going to be a cost. It's not going to be easy. So run it with perseverance. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Look at Jesus because he's the only one who's run this race perfectly. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He says to consider him, literally to compare yourself to him. And all of us can do that this morning. We can look at whatever suffering that we're enduring and we can compare it to the suffering of Christ. And in comparison, it's small. And then he says, you're struggling. You're struggling against sin, against this, in this case, not meaning you do the wrong thing, but this evil force in the world is after you. He begins this passage by uh, comparing our race, our lives to the race, the marathon that Olympians the Olympians ran, and now he's comparing us to another Olympic activity, pugilism, or what we would call boxing. And he says, you are facing off against adversaries that are punching you in the face, but look, you have not yet resisted or faced off to the point of shedding your blood. It hasn't cost you physical harm and even death yet. There's a promise in this. It hasn't cost you what it cost Jesus yet. So don't quit. Don't quit now. It's going to get harder. There is a cost of discipleship, a cost of discipleship. Now, this isn't what I was told when I was six years old at a little Baptist church surrounded by pine trees in East Texas. We had a revival. Now, in Texas, pastors believe the word revival comes from an ancient Greek word that means to holler. So for five days, this pastor yelled at us what he called the good news. And at the end of every sermon, it would end something like this. If you leave church this morning, you walk out in that parking lot, you can get hit by a truck. A truck! There are a lot of trucks in Texas. <laughs> and if you don't know Jesus, that truck's going to send you straight to hell. Straight to hell. Who needs Jesus? Well, I ran down the center aisle as fast as I could. <laughs> which I thought was called the center aisle. It's not, it's the center aisle. I ran down that aisle and I didn't know that my Sunday school shoes could even get that kind of speed, but I made it to the front and I filled out this little three by five commitment card, you know, with one of those tiny pencils made for golfers and sinful six-year-olds. And I just wrote on that card in big, bold letters, I need Jesus. And for the next 57 stanzas of just as I am, as the choir sang, I added exclamation marks to that card. I am not going to that parking lot by myself. I am scared of trucks. You better give me Jesus. <laughs> and that's how we often get saved in America. It might be not be quite as dramatic as, as my story, but we often come to Jesus in America to be safe. There's this great danger out there at the end of life, and I come to Jesus, and he saves me from it. And I believe that. I believe there is a real separation for eternity from God. And without Jesus, that's what I'll suffer. But Jesus didn't just come to save me from the danger at the end of my life, but to send me out to live a life of danger. Jesus promised it to us in John chapter 15, verse 20. Remember what I told you, he said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Now, I always run my teaching by my wife because she's much smarter than I am, and she always has some kind of question, like, well, you didn't explain this, and she had a great question this time. That was really good. So I'm going to spend a few minutes answering her question, because it might be a question on your mind, too. Her question was, but why were they suffering? Why were people persecuting the Christians? What made them so mad? Like, specifically, what was it? So I want us to walk through this to have a better understanding, not to endorse what they believed or how they lived their lives, but to cause us to think more deeply about what we believe and how we live our lives. 
First of all, why Christians were persecuted at this time in history is that they were considered a Jewish cult. They had broken off from Judaism. So think about it the way that maybe you and I would look at Mormonism. Well, you've taken our faith and you've twisted it a bit. And so Jews would look at, Christi- look at Christians and say, well, you took Judaism and you twisted it a bit. And you're saying that the Messiah isn't coming someday, but that he's already come and that we don't have to do all these things and jump through all these hoops to please God, that he just forgives us? This grace thing is scary and weird, and that's a twisting of the truth. And so they were mad at us for that because we took their faith and we changed it. But the Romans became more and more angry with us, more and more angry. They ended up becoming a much fiercer enemy of the church than the Jews were. And why is that? Well, first of all, the Romans believed that Christians were immoral and dangerous. You see, they knew that because we were mostly slaves and women, and so we didn't have freedom to meet during the day, so we would meet before the sun came up, or as the Romans said, under the cover of darkness they meet. And they knew that we ate flesh and drank blood. And we called one another brother and sister. And then we greeted each other with a kiss. That's incestuous and strange. These people are cannibals. And they're dating their sisters. Like, this is weird. So we were dangerous and we were immoral. They were just terrified of us. So Christians, we we tried to reason with our enemies and explain, no, 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 we're not the horrible people you think we are. Like, take these words from the early church pastor named Cyprian. He said, none of us offers resistance when he is seized or avenges himself for your unjust violence, although our people are numerous and plentiful. In other words, there are a lot of us. We could whoop you if we wanted to, but we're not. It is not lawful for us to hate. And so we please God more when we render no requital for injury and we repay your hatred with kindness. They just didn't understand us. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that they called us atheists. You see, the Romans worshiped gods that you could go in a temple and see. I mean, there was a statue. You could see their gods were real. But our God is imaginary. Oh, wait, he exists in our heart and somewhere far off. I mean, you can't even see that. You're worshiping your imaginary friend, the Romans said to You're atheists. You're not worshiping real gods. The fourth reason that we were being persecuted is that we were horrible for the economy. There were people who felt like the poor shouldn't be cared for, that they were poor because they were lazy or because the gods wanted them to be poor. But we bent over backwards to help everybody, friend and enemy alike, and it was just really terrible for the economy. We refused to be capitalists, to be consumerists. We, we wanted to deny ourselves. Jesus said, deny yourself and follow me. He said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, like a camel going through the eye of a needle. So we lived simply and we helped others simply live. And that was very strange in Rome. These words from Justin Martyr, early church pastor, he said, we who formerly treasured money and possessions more than anything else now hand over everything we have to a treasury for all and we share it with everyone who needs it. And lastly, and this is the biggest one, this was what they even killed Jesus for is they believed that we were a threat to Caesar. We were unpatriotic. Being a great Christian meant being a pretty bad Roman. We were nonviolent. You refused to take up arms against anyone. You couldn't be baptized into the church of Jesus Christ while serving in the government or in the military. And Tertullian, an early church father, wrote these words, is it not more lawful to be slain than to slay? Christ, in disarming Peter, disarmed every soldier. The Romans said, we will kill for our king, and Christians said, we'll die for ours. We refused to go to the Colosseums and to see the gladiators kill one another or to see the criminals executed. We didn't want any part of it. And that was such a key part of Roman society that we were terrible Romans and we were thought to not really love the country. Athenagoras of Athens said, none fight better for the king than we do, though we do not fight under him, even if he demands it. Yet we fight on his behalf forming a special army, an army of godliness, by offering our prayers to God. We no longer take sword against nation, having become sons of peace for the sake of Jesus, 
who is our leader. They declared that Jesus was Lord. And that was a politically loaded revolutionary statement that made them terrible Romans and a real danger to the empire. Nobody liked them. There was a man named Polycarp, an early pastor in the early church. He lived in Smyrna, not the one down the road, the one on the other side of the world. And his church was being rounded up. Christians were being brought into the Colosseum and they were being killed. And the, the local governor, he said, well, instead of sawing off the branches of this tree, why don't we just cut the root off? The branches will wither. So they went and arrested the pastor, Polycarp, 86 years old. He was a disciple of John, who was a disciple of Jesus. And so they rounded him up. Now, two days before he was arrested, he had a dream that his pillow had burst into flames. And he awoke and he told his servants, they're coming for me. I'm going to die by burning. Prepare a meal because my captors are coming. We need to welcome them. Two days later, the Roman soldiers arrived and he had spread out a great banquet for them. He welcomed in his enemies, gave water to their horses, told them to sit down and to rest. They'd had a long journey. And he said, could you, while you dine, would you just give me an hour to pray to my God to prepare my soul to meet its end? And one of the soldiers later wrote that he had never met a man so pious. So Polycarp prayed for an hour and then some, and then they didn't have to tie him up or bind him or coerce him to go with them. He went willingly, and they rode him on a donkey into the Colosseum, and they demanded that he declare, Caesar is Lord. It's no big deal. It's just three little words. Caesar is Lord. Just say it, and you can spare your life. He refused, and instead he said, to the Colosseum filled with an angry mob. 86 years I have served Christ and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? So they stood him against the stake. He said, you don't have to tie me up. The God who gives me strength will help me stand in the flames. And they lit him on fire. And the church didn't wither, but it multiplied. There is a cost to discipleship. And when we pay that cost, we are blessed, and through us many more are. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Not because you're angry or because you've ranted on Facebook or you're just generally obnoxious, but because you are like me. That's why they hate you. You're blessed when that happens, favored by God. So the question is, if there's a cost of discipleship, the question that we need to wrestle with this morning is, well, what does my faith cost me? You know, suffering for following Jesus, it looks different here, but it still happens. It strains friendships. It severs marriages. There's a price to pay even here. So what is the cost that we're paying for our faith? Paying a price for following Jesus isn't something that just happened in Rome 2,000 years ago. It's something that is still happening right today, now, in parts of the world. I want to introduce you to a follower of Jesus in North Korea. Her name is Hei Wu. Watch this. So, 아이들이 와서 기도 아버지가 기도하라고 했고 예수님을 믿으라고 했다고 우리 아버지가 믿는 예수님도 좋은 분일 거라고 해서 그때부터 우리는 기도하기 시작을 했습니다. 아 이렇게 아들이 손을 잡아당기고 거기다가 예수님을 믿어라 
예수님은 눈으로는 볼수 없지만 예수님은 확실히 계시고 일을 하신다. 아, 북성대에서 감옥에서 아, 안기부 간첩으로 몰려가지고 그 복음을 전하고 밤에는 몰래 복음을 전하고 아픈 사람 기도해주고 그러면서 이제 거기서 아, 그렇게 그 사역을 할때 하나님께서 그 사람을 통해서 그 감옥에다가 지하교회를 세워주셨어요. 아, 저희 남편은 아, 정말 음, 아, 나는 이제 죽어도 천국이 있다. 천국 소망이 있기 때문에 이제 죽어도 나는 아쉬, 이 세상에 아쉬울 것이 없다고 그냥 그런 이야기를 했다고 그래요. Look with me in verse 5 of chapter 12. And you, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? And that word addresses means to sit down and to reason together. Isn't that an incredible, an incredible picture of the God of the universe, all powerful and all perfect, sits down with imperfect little measly me and actually wants to talk to me? That's incredible that he stoops to father me. It says, this encouragement he says to us, my son, do not make light of or think that it's not very important, the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart or say, man, this is too hard, I'm gonna give up when he rebukes you. But verse six, because the Lord disciplines the one that he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Accepts, not tolerates, not just kind of puts up with, but accepts to embrace, to completely welcome just the way that we are but to love us so much the way that we are that he won't leave us that way. My youngest son, so there's a father of discipleship. My, the, my youngest son, Sambaji, who is now uh, 12 years old, when he became my son, moved all the way here from India when he was four and a half years old. That's a big change of culture and reality. And so there was a lot for him to learn. He'd never had Christian chicken before or... Or mayonnaise. I mean, there's some wonderful things he'd missed out on. There was a lot to teach him. Now, what made it, one of the things that he had to learn was just what love is. One night, you took him into bed. I kissed him, and I said, I love you, buddy. And he said, what is love you? I said, well, love means that I big, 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 big like you. And the more bigs I said, and the farther apart my arms got, the louder he laughed. How cool is that that anyone would big like us? It's pretty amazing. But then he had to figure out, well, what does it mean, though, to have a father who big likes me? What does that even mean? And it was hard for him because Holly Baruso lived behind us. The Baruso's house is apparently like Disneyland. And so Sambaji would go over there and play at Holly's house. And numerous occasions, he would come home raving about how great life is at Holly's house. It was fantastic. <laughs> Especially, it seemed, at dinner. At dinner, when I would say, hey, you've got to finish your broccoli. You have to at least try the salmon. Then in a very passive, aggressive, clever, five-year-old way, he would say, at Holly's house, we have cookies. <laughs> And that's great. It's great to go visit your friend's house, but your friend is not your father. And your father is not your friend. And a father wants what is good for you. And what is good for you is not cookies, Holly. It's not <laughs> What's good for us doesn't necessarily feel good. So we have a father, though, who loves us and disciplines us out of love. Now, in the next verse, endure hardship then as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Now, this word discipline in our culture, if we say discipline, we mean like I'm going to light you up because you did something wrong. It's not punishment, though, in this verse. This word means to tame or to train, to, to take a wild beast and to put a bridle on it and a saddle and put it in the direction it needs to be going. I don't know about you, but I need some taming. 
And I need a lot of training. And that training is to make me more and more like Jesus and to be pointed in the direction that God, my Father, wants me to go. And a loving father tames and trains his children. It doesn't seem good, but it is good. We've all been in the grocery store with a three-year-old who is not being tamed and trained by mom and dad. We've all been there. It's not good for them. It's not good for the rest of us who have to live with them. Taming and training is good. And we have a father who loves us enough to do it. And so the hard things of life, and in this passage, specifically persecution, it's a way that God tames us and trains us to be more like Jesus. So there is a cost of discipleship, but we have a father in discipleship. And so the question we need to ask now is, how is my father disciplining me? The hard thing that I'm going through in life, it's probably not persecution to the degree that these early Christians were suffering, but there's something hard that you're walking through. How is God using that to discipline us? The the last and final truth from this passage is that not only is there a cost of discipleship and there is a father involved in our discipleship, but there is a harvest of discipleship. The harvest of discipleship. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? Respect it to turn to. Theologians think that this could be one of two things, or maybe both, that we respect God the Father, we, we turn to. So our fathers on earth, they discipline us, and who, who here is a parent who has, who has ever said to their child, look at me when I'm talking to you, right? It's a sign of respect that when you're going through this hard thing, look at me when I'm talking to you. I'm trying to talk to you, God is saying. I'm trying to talk to you like your earthly father did, so would you please turn to me and just listen? <laughs> And the second thing it could mean is that we turn to God because we know our need for what God has. God, there's this thing in my life that just doesn't look like Jesus. I I have this decision. I don't really know what to do. So God, I'm going to turn to you. I'm going to turn to you and ask you to give me the answers. Give me the help. Give me the correction that I need. And so we turn to our earthly fathers. How much more should we turn to our heavenly father who is so much more powerful and so much more wise and loving? In verse 10, our earthly fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought was best, but God disciplines us for our good and in order that we may share in his holiness. Our good, this really is for our benefit. So hang in there. This is making you more like Jesus. And when you become more like Jesus, you will stand out. That's what holiness is, to not be like anyone else. So the question we ask is will I turn to my father? Will I, in the middle of the hard thing I'm struggling with, say, God, I'm turning to you. I'm listening to you. And I want you to speak to me. Would you teach me? Would you tame and train me in this hard season of my life? Romans 8, 28 tells us the benefits of doing this. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. For what? To become conformed to the image of his son, to be like Jesus, to have a family resemblance to God the Father. Romans 5, Paul says, we glory in our sufferings. We celebrate even in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Hebrews 12, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, it's, it's hard to celebrate. It's hard. It's painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, right thinking and feeling and desiring and living, and peace, peace inside of us, contentment, but peace with one another as well. But it only does this for those who allow themselves to be trained by it. Those who do the heavy lifting in the gymnasium of suffering. I want us to get the end of Hewu's story because it's a beautiful picture of how even in the worst suffering, even right now in the world, God is using intense persecution to train and tame his people, to shape their character, and then through them to shape the world in a way that nothing else can. Watch this. He 
이것을 묵상하면 잠깐만 이렇게 하나님께 이 말씀으로 나를 위로해 주시고 힘을 주고 여호와는 나의 목자시니 내가 부족함이 없으리로다 주가 나를 부른 처장에 누이시며 실망한 물가로 인도하시리로다 나의 영을 서생시키시며 자기 이름을 위하여 의 길로 인도하시도다 내가 사망의 음침한 골짜기로 다닐지라도 해를 두려워하지 아니할 것은 주께서 나와 함께 하십니다 내가 거기서 정말 무사히 나올 수가 있었고 하나님 은혜로 아, 정말 주님 뜻에 합당한데 기도가 응답되고 그 나라에도 신앙의 자유가 올 날이 있을 줄로 믿으면서 항상 정말 그 날을 기다리는 인내하면서 우리가 주셔서 감사하고 그래서 항상 이 노래를 부를 때마다 자꾸 이렇게 눈물을 흘리게 되죠 주님 은혜가 너무 감사해가지고 같은 죄인 살리신 주 은혜 고마워 잃었던 생명 찾았고 광명을 얻었네. Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for seeing us, wretches like us, and saving us, welcoming us, not just tolerating us, as a good, good father. who is making us holy. We thank you for that, God. For those who are suffering in this room right now, going through hard seasons, God, turn them to you to hear your instruction and your encouragement and to learn from the season and to pull out of the darkness tremendous treasures, a great harvest. God, thank you that you don't leave us in our pain and our suffering, but you are a father who sticks with us. We are not orphaned. God, we thank you For those around the world who are braver than I think maybe I could be, who are suffering at great cost to be a disciple of Jesus, God, remind us every day to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And God, we thank you. We are so grateful. On this day, maybe more than most days out of the year, we are so thankful for the freedom that we have here. What a privilege, what a gift that that is from you, God. that we are able to worship here with no fear of reprisal, suffering no harm. And we thank you for that, God. May we make the most of that freedom and proclaim the good news every chance we get, boldly, kindly, gently, lovingly. May we take advantage of our freedom and spend it for the benefit of the kingdom, never taking for granted what so many in the world don't have. We love you, God. And we thank you that you love us. We celebrate you now, God, our good and loving Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.